Hey, Dr. Bill Dorfman here. So today our Meet the Mentor is one of my illustrious patients who has had a very successful career in the acting world. Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. Why do we do these? Meet the Mentor actually was born at a leap. We put on a program every summer. We've done this for the past 16 years called Leap Week. And Leap Week this year will be July 17th to the 23rd at the illustrious UCLA campus. What's LEAP? LEAP is an entrepreneurship program for high school and college students aged 15 to 25 that we've taught at UCLA for the last 16 years. What do we teach? We teach students skills to be successful in life. And the coolest thing about LEAP is that I've asked so many of my celebrity patients and business leaders to come and help, and they do. We've had Mark Wahlberg, Paula Abdul, Michael Strahan, Kathy Bates, Anthony Hopkins, Apollo Ono, Eric Garcetti, Jason Alexander. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And these people come and share the secrets of their success with our LEAP students. Typically, we get about 500 to 550 students every summer, and we literally pack them with so much information. It's like drinking from a fire hose. And one of the parts that the students love most is when we bring in these mentors. So we started this Meet the Mentor series because we didn't want this to just be a one and done week. We wanted to do it throughout the year and continue to give these students great information from great mentors to teach them how to do businesses in every field you could ever imagine. I'm super excited to introduce you to Kevin. Let me tell you a little bit about Kevin. Kevin Ziegers is a Canadian actor and model. He began his performing career at the age of six, appearing in about 30 commercials. His first film role was at the age of seven. It was a small part in the Michael J. Fox comedy, Life with Mickey. Subsequently, he made a guest appearance on the acclaimed science fiction series, X-Files, and had a recurring role on the Canadian TV series, Traders. During this time, he appeared in several made-for-television films. His career kind of made a big boost when he won the role of Josh Fram in Air Bud. Air Bud launched a franchise with four sequels that Kevin was in, all four. In 2005, he had a major role in the Academy Award-nominated independent film Transamerica, co-starring Felicity Huffman. Kevin performed as Toby Osborne and was praised by critics. He actually won the Trophy Chopard for Male Revelation at the 2006 Cannes Film Festival. He guest starred as Damien in Gossip Girl from 2009 to 2010 and then returned again in late 2010 for multiple episodes throughout season four and currently stars as the rookie FBI agent Brendan Akers in the ABC crime drama, The Rookie Feds, with my favorite, Nisi Nash. Mm. Welcome to Meet the Mentor. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You look fun. awesome. Oh, thank you. You just sorted me out after a season. You sorted my teeth out. So I yeah, this was lucky. So Kevin was in the other day and said, uh -huh. Doc, I just finished my season. I said, great. Let's do Meet the Mentor on Friday. Here we are. He had, a, he had a drill in my mouth when he asked me, so I didn't feel like I had much of a choice. You couldn't say no. Exactly. So you started your career in the Sears catalog. Yeah, basically. I, I, I grew up, um, I don't like to use the word poor, but it's the only, we lived very uh, modestly uh, growing up. Dude, we were poor. Yes. It's okay. Yeah, exactly. I grew up as poor as poor could yeah. be. Yeah, so... There was no aspiration. Nobody in my family's in the arts. Um, it was just, uh, I think somebody came up to us at like a trade show or something in my hometown and offered me and my sisters a job to take pictures for a Sears catalog or something. And for my parents, it was just extra money. Um, Toronto, which is the big city, which is about two hours from where we grew up, is... Uh, is where they sort of said, oh, well, if you want more of this, you could take them to Toronto and do auditions of whatever there. Uh, my mother was very young. I mean, she's still young, but um, she was in her early 20s at this time and um, started taking my sisters and I to Toronto. And we, we 
found a lot of work. And that was kind of the inception of it. I didn't really know what I was doing. I, 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 frankly, I didn't until I was in my 20s. Um, you're just sort of, you know, child actors are just probably like emotionally intelligent kids who know how to please like their adult. Um, and so I kind of did that until I was, until I moved here at 17. And when you got here at 17, where was your formal training prior to that? Or was uh, there any? No, I mean, I'd been on set my whole life. So the, the technical training of being on set, which is for some people really difficult. I, I, anybody who I speak to, there's like two kinds of actors. There's actors who are so proficient in the artistic side of it and understand everything about character and text. and um, But then you put them on a set and they're lost. They fall they, apart. Yeah. They, you know, when it comes to lighting and marks and the pace of it and um, just the technical aspect of, of shooting something is, is daunting. And so I think when I moved here, I was very proficient at the technical side. I could have shot a film by myself, um, but I had no idea about what it meant to be like an actual actor, what that entailed uh, to self-motivate. I'd only ever been offered things. Um, after I did those Airbud movies, it was pretty much, I'd shoot five or six films a year that were just sort of handed to me. And I wasn't particularly good. I was just famous, um, which, and you know, charming was probably the only thing that I knew how to do at that point, was how to sort of charm people. Um, and that doesn't get you very far here. So I, I, when I came here, the only thing that I really had was some technical training and enough money to last a couple of years was kind of what so I So what with. made the transformation to where it was kind of like this fell in your lap hobby to a real profession? Well, I really scuttled around here for a while. I, I worked a little bit, but nothing particularly good. Um, and most of it was to do with like whatever residual fame I had from being the kid from Airbud. The Airbud kid. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I s was ready to go back home and figure something out to do. Um, I took my SATs to sort of see where I could get into college. I wasn't going to go back to Canada, but I was. I did well enough in school that I could have done something. And then I, I read a script called Transamerica that I had no business doing. This, this required a really talented actor. Because it just so happened the role was suited enough to me. It was this sort of lost kid who you only had his charm and his physical whatever it was to manipulate people to like him. Otherwise, he was completely lost. And I, for whatever reason, the director and Felicity, who was a producer on the film also, after I met with them and auditioned a couple of times, I remember Felicity, I don't remember the specifics, saying like, I don't even know if he's good, but he's just this kid. He's like, he has every, like his nature is very much what we need for this. So they hired me for that film. Um, and from that point, moving forward, obviously with some ebbs and flows in there, was the introduction to what, how I see now what it means to be a professional um, artist or actor, uh, which so is very you, different than just working. As so you come to Hollywood yep. from Canada, mm -hmm. which is like Farmerville. Right. Yeah, where I live. You're yeah. 17 years old, mm -hmm. and you've got the bright lights and the glamour and the glitz and all that. How'd that affect you? Well, I mean, it's conf it's certainly confusing. I, I think in retrospect, I meet a 17 year old now, and I go, "Wow, that's very young to be on your own, right? With no boundaries. I didn't really know anybody here, um, so I was sort of left to my own devices. I had a multitude of other sort of personal issues from from my childhood that. Um, after some success in my early 20s, um, addiction became a, a part of my story. So that kind of uh, whatever success I had after Transamerica, and I did a few f films after that that I'm still very proud of, but the alcoholism was starting to sort of take over my life um, in my early to mid 20s. So it's difficult. I mean, it, it, it's not a business of... You know, like I, I have so much, um, I'm so envious of 
any of my friends who have jobs that require them to go somewhere. Um, I think it's so, it's the thing that I learned as I got older that I need, regardless of whether I'm working or not, is I need a place to be. And I think the difficulty for actors, and I think some people think, oh, they get caught up in so much money and it's easy to be stoned and drink and all this. It's like, I think it has less to do with that and more to do with just structure, I think. Um, human beings need some structure. I, I'm envious of the fact that you go in and you're handed something and you're like, okay, this is my day. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, equally, I'm envious of the fact that you took something that was a big challenge in your life, Yeah. you conquered it, and now you're committed to helping other people conquer it as well. Yeah, you know? I mean, that the program that I sort of uh, use is, is one of a tremendous amount of people were of, of service to me uh, when, I, when I ended up getting sober. Um, and it sort of coincided with people helping me with my career. We'll, we'll talk about it, but you know, the mentors who are, are still close to me to this day are people who saw, and how the, usually the people that I end up mentoring are the same thing where I go like, I see this thing and God, they can't get out of their own way. There's like, yeah. there's something so obvious to me that they're missing, that I need to help them overcome this. Some people talk too much. Some people talk their way out of a good situation. Some people don't work hard enough. But some people are yes. just brutally honest. Yes. And that really helps. And maybe you can share with us a little bit about how that really helped form your career. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I what I need, and everyone's different, but and I'm, I'm not generalizing sexes over, but I, I, the, most of the men that I sponsor in AA, because you're supposed to just sponsor people of the same sex, it keeps things uncomplicated. Right. Um, well, or more complicated. Or more complicated, dep exactly. <laughs> um, but I find that direct, sometimes painful honesty um, is the only thing that penetrates. And for me, I didn't know what was up or down, I didn't know what was truth or what, I was just functioning in this place of like, do you like me, do you not like me, is this working, is it not working? And I needed someone to say to me like, you have this thing, this, this, whatever this gift is that you have, this precious thing, you don't work at it, um, you're, you rely completely on whatever natural talent you have and you're sort of pissing it away. And you're gonna wake up one day and it's gonna be gone. Um, and I don't want to see that happen as a peer of yours. Um, and so there were a couple of people, Vince D'Onofrio, who's been a friend of mine since oh, I was, since before I got sober, he played my father in a film when I was about 21. Um, and he was just very helpful in the way that I try to be helpful to other actors now, which is to say, well, what are you doing? Some actors will say like, oh, I'm not getting this job and I keep auditioning and no one's picking me. There's this victimhood mentality that a lot of actors have. I, I've had it in the past too. And he was so, and, and is still consistently saying, well, what are you doing? Um, and I'll say, well, I'm auditioning and nothing's happening. He's like, no, 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 but what are you doing? Like, uh, tell me where you're going to, uh, to control the outcome for yourself. And it was, it, I think some people feel like, and there is so much chance with what I do for a living. Um, I don't have the luxury of a degree from Harvard that says you're a certified, talented, reliable right. actor. That just doesn't come to us. And so in some ways you have to create that for yourself. And I think I still will occasionally pop into class. I still see a coach all the time before I start work. And I think there's this, Maybe the way the world looks right now, which is that to be famous or to achieve some money or success uh, can, can come very easily, that for the most part, the most talented people I know just work the hardest. It's like any other profession. Um, and have the highest tolerance for uh, rejection and to just sort of go, uh, 
there's a, you know, they wake up the next day and yeah, proceed I mean, as... you're literally in probably one of the hardest professions in the world. I mean, yeah. Anthony Hopkins yeah. has become a very good friend of mine. He yeah. hates to be called Anthony. You have to call him Tony. Tony. Yeah. Tony comes in and I'm like, Tony, how are you? I'm unemployed. Yeah. I'm like, dude, like you're not going to get another job. I mean, you're probably one of the most famous actors in but the world. But he's not wrong. But in he's that, not wrong. The second that you, know. the second you, you, you complete something, you are by virtue of that completion. And by the way, for he's job. 84 years old yeah. and sharp as a tack. Mm -hmm. He takes care of himself. Yeah. He, I mean, he is one of the most delightful people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. And works hard. Yeah, and I think uh, to just sort of. I, I remember the co first conversation that I, I had it with Vince while I was working with him, and I also happened to be at a, a film festival in Toronto, um, at the Toronto Film Festival, and Phil Hoffman was there with a movie, and at these film festivals, they sort of clump actors together because the press sort of comes through and you do these, and he was always, I saw him, we had two long interactions, and they were both at the Toronto Film Festival, and he was always sitting outside smoking cigarettes, and um, he saw Transamerica, so I, this was the year after that, and he's like, so what are you doing, you know? He, was, he loves art, artists and actors. He's like, so what are you up to? Like, what's the, what's the plan? What are you working on? Um, and I would give my child actor answer, because I still didn't really know. And he's like, no, 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 but what are you working on? Like, what are you, where are the, where are the holes in your game that you're focused on? And I didn't really have an answer, and his voice is constantly echoed in my head his and Vince's to sort of, I think we feel like as actors, if, if we're not being paid to do it, it doesn't count. Um, mm. At least that's the way that my brain works, is that if I'm not, if someone doesn't tell me that, uh, if they're not paying me a ton of money to show up on set and put my costume on and, and perform the dialogue that they've given me and, and provide a service, that it's not acting. And he was so clear with me I think he said this in, you can dig around on YouTube, I think he said this in, to the press at one point or another, but he was so direct with me in that he's like, if you are fortunate enough even to walk into a building in Hollywood somewhere where there's five people who've rented out an office space and they're sitting at a desk and they're sitting in chairs and they've got your picture in front of them, if you have their undivided attention for 10 minutes and if you're fortunate enough that it's Quentin Tarantino or, or whoever, the people that you're sitting in front of, that is your job. Whether it, they hire you to show up on set and continue to do it doesn't really matter. That, 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 that is what we do. And so totally. I think a lot of people feel like unless it's captured and released, which is very much the way society works now, there's some ownership of like, well... Unless people see me do it, it doesn't count. And I think as time has passed and as I've gotten older, what I realize is some of the, the, some of the most valuable growth that I've had has been in some audition room for a job I never got. I had no business getting, but something happened in there where I was like, oh, that's an interesting part of this art form that I never considered that I would be able to do and then I go home and I work on it and now on my show that I'm doing, I know that I have this other thing that I wanna try out. And I think the mistake for actors is to feel like unless you're working, you're not successful or unless someone's patting you on the back or unless you're getting an award. I always find the Oscars just happen and I love watching them mostly because I what you were saying about Tony is true. Everyone in there, except for the really famous people, unless Leo's in there, or, and I know a lot of the people who are in there, they are all thinking what Tony says, which is like, this is really nice, but like, I, I don't have a Am job. Am I ever going to work again? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, almost, uh, it's almost a plague that like the best female actress mm -hmm. doesn't book stuff a lot of times for years and years and years afterwards. Totally. This it, woman who was in that uh, Banshees of Inish, this woman, Carrie Condon, yeah. who's amazing. She's like, there's not a single person who wouldn't want, she has to audition for things. You know what I mean? She's going to like, 
sit in front of people that maybe she wants to do it 100% or maybe she thinks it's a good thing, but like this fantasy that all of a sudden you've made it. And a lot of the people that I know, actors who I admire their careers, the Tonys, the Vince D'Onofrio's, the Bradley Coopers, the people who you'd go like, they've, all they do is sit around and read right. scripts. It's like, it doesn't work that way. Without fail, you know, Brad Pitt wants to do what Tom Cruise is doing. And Tom Cruise is like, why aren't I getting that movie? If the benchmark is only how am I being received or if I am being, like, I, 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 we just finished this season of my show and it's like, for nine months now, it's been, you know, the paychecks come and the show's doing well. And, um, but the, the thing that I need to focus on and the thing that I've gotten a little bit better at is like, it's no different than it was last year when I couldn't get arrested or the year before that when things were great and I had a couple of movies coming out. Like, it doesn't, the external feedback, while obviously important to keep the lights on, are not indicative of the progress you're making. I know this guy, Jonathan Tucker, who's one of my best friends and a fellow actor, and we have very similar kind of trajectories where things will be going really well and then they'll slow down. And the people who I know, who I can watch and go like, that person is over the long haul gonna rise to the top, are the people who are just stubbornly working at it. Um, the ones who just sort of say, I just need to get a little bit better. And, the, you know, that's why when people ask me, oh, well, I want to, you know, I want to do what you do. And the only thing that I ask them first before I say anything is like, how much tolerance do you have for rejection over the course of a long right. period of time? And what are you willing to do? To what are you willing to, are, like, how much suffering are you willing to endure? Yeah, no, I get it. It's a really difficult, being married to actresses yeah. was painful. Yeah. You know, it was painful for me because, I, you know, I want to work more. I just book more patients. I do more. I, Correct. I'm in complete control of uh -huh. my career. Yeah. No matter how great you are, you're yeah. not. I mean, unless you become so incredibly rich and famous that you could just like put together movies yourself. Right. But other than that, you have to always count on people to believe in you, people to fund you, people mm -hmm. to come up with projects for you. Yeah. And that's a very, very difficult thing for a, a type A personality person. And you can't motivate your way into work. No. Um, which is unfortunately why the, the people who are super type A, I find, I often steer them in like, there are jobs in my profession that you can control. Correct. You know, there's the, the guy, the, there's this guy, Robert, who is the uh, steady cam operator on my show, um, my show, our show. Um, he's the best steady cam operator I ever met. And he comes in every single day and he is like, he takes his job seriously. And I have such an appreciation for people who, regardless of what they do, my stand in, this guy, Jim who's in his 60s, I'm being generous, but he has like, he knows all of my dialogue, he's there half an hour early, he's wearing like a t-shirt, the same color as the suit that I'm wearing. I mean, this is a guy who- He's a professional. A professional, and I yeah. think it's become a little, I think people underestimate how important that is to the people who like, anyone who is a, is a you know, my wife runs the, uh, a department in her company and she's like, more than anything, more than you know, some guy who graduated at the top of his class at Harvard, she's like, I want people who are motivated and who care and people who work hard. And I think objectively people look at like the TikTok or the right. these people who have become famous um, but the, pe the people who over the long term, the people who you admire are generally just the hardest worker in the room. But I'll be honest with you, those people that have become insta famous, the really famous ones really work hard too. Correct. Yes. You know, the, the, the problem is, is their audience doesn't think that. And right. they, it looks you simple. know, and then they're like, oh, I'm not going to go to college. I'm just going to become an influencer. Right. right. You know, so I have this famous influencer come in and, right. you know, we decide to do Zoom whitening for her for free. Yeah. And I said, you know, when's the last time you had your teeth cleaned? She goes, oh, like eight years ago. Right. I'm like, yeah, maybe you should book that. She goes, how much is it? So I tell her, she goes, oh, I don't know if I can afford that. Right. I'm like, really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, 
I just, I think it, we can overcomplicate what it takes to, the people you sort of look and go like, aspirationally, like, golly, look at Bradley Cooper. It's so right. easy. He just write, And it's like, no, he has to sit in his house and write a script but about he, Leonard Bernstein yeah. and research it and then put it together and direct it. And it's like the amount of work so totally. that you can watch him go, oh, yeah, but he's in this Lady Gaga movie. And it's like, no, 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 that's three years of 11 and, hours and a day. And vocal lessons. And, All and, of and, that. And. If you could reflect back on your career and say, this was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my career, what would that this be? Probably, which was also the hardest, but probably meeting Felicity Huffman. Yeah. Who, in no uncertain terms, said, you're not very good at this. <laughs> and I need you to be, because this movie won't work unless you are. And so... All of this stuff you're doing, y you need to cut that out. And we need to like get to work. Um, and we rehearsed for almost a month on that film. But it was such a shift of like, okay, now, now, I, it's, now it's entirely up to me how much I put into this or how much effort and how much uh, of, of my ego I'm willing to throw aside. And when things get hard, I sort of look... but. But I needed that. I don't, I'm not someone who needs a pat on the back. It's not good for me. Um, yeah, and you know what? We're all motivated you know, in different ways. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, I, I think, is a really powerful thing, too. Yeah. And even with now men that I sponsor in AA, and they're saying, you know, well, God, my wife, and I just, I, I just want to... And it's like all, uh, certain men I deal with differently, but for the most part, I say, grow up. Grow up. Life is hard. This is not meant to be easy. Right. And the people that I know who I love are the people who, in spite of that, continue. The you people know, who are, are told no had the door slammed in their face and go, I'm going to figure out another way to get in there. And those are the people who, uh, whatever it is that they're doing, uh, are not just successful but are content because I'm not content because I just miraculously landed on a TV show. It's that over the course of 10 years, I have a relationship with the studio and the network, and I've built up uh, a foundation. A foundation where I feel like I'm able to walk into it, and it's a transaction where they're getting something and I'm getting something. Well, and you deliver. Correct. You know, I mean, I always tell kids at Leap one of the hardest things in life is that we compare our deepest, darkest insides mm -hmm. to everybody else's bright, sunny outside. Right. You know, you don't always get the opportunity to see their deepest, darkest insides. No. And so it's not a fair comparison. Well, and for the most part, I, I, I've never had to do anything else to make a living. And so I'm like, I'm winning. Yeah, As, that's if you're a looking at winning, in your field. And 99% of my experience with the business of acting is failure. And so I think part of the, like you were just saying, I think some people go, oh my God, look, he made it. He's on a TV show, he was in a nice house, he's got these two beautiful kids, he goes to work, look at his Instagram page, everything's so nice. And it's like, yes, however, the day-to-day -day of it is that it's usually like, eh, you're a little short or mm, not quite, maybe you're too old or too young or what, whatever it is. And that cannot be... You know, it can't define you. And it doesn't. I think my biggest fear now and my biggest fear for a lot of actors who I talk to and is like, I never want you to be in a situation where they say yes. Like if I remember I, I screen tested for a movie which shall remain nameless when I was 21, drinking heavily right after Transamerica, which was a huge movie. And, I, and they wanted me to get it. They told me, like, just don't screw this up in the, in the screen test. And I, in retrospect, it, by God's grace, I didn't. I did screw it up, and it didn't happen for me. I would have had no idea how to live in that space. I would have failed miserably uh, on set, in advertising the movie. Something would have happened that I would have... I was completely ill-prepared for that. And I think now, all that I 
prepare myself for is that when the time comes, when the phone rings and they go like, we're ready for you, whether it's on this show or on a movie or whatever, that I'm able to walk in the door. You don't want to show up and have someone say like, all right, great. Here, I need you to do this for me and for you to go, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, I'm, not, right, right. I'm not completely prepared to do that thing that you think you want me to do. And I think that's our job as actors. It's what I try to teach people as much as I can is like, it's not about this particular thing. You need to be ready when the door does knock that you can walk in and not fall on your face. So if, if, if I'm a young student watching this and I want to really have a career in acting, what are some things you would advise them to do you know, now while they're in school and, and beyond? I mean, I think you just need to be doing it. It's like, I think anything else, I, 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 I'm not a believer of like this, I gotta get my shots and I gotta meet with agents. It's like all that crap takes care of itself. You need to be in class with other actors um, and with a teacher who's hard on you because the world will be much harder on you than even that teacher might possibly be. Really? And I've seen in a lot of cases, I still will go to cl class occasionally, where the teacher has the bravery to say, this is not for you. And I think for a lot of people who think maybe they wanna be actors, those, those people need to be weeded out first before the, you know, before they're 50 and still holding on to some dream that nobody had the audacity to just go, this is just not for you. You're not cut out for this. It, whatever it is that you're feeling inside isn't coming through your face. And sometimes it's as simple as that. Because yeah. you can look at Tony, Tony only because I, uh, Hopkins, and like he, he's built for it. And he found his way because he works really hard, but like some people are made for it and others aren't. And so my advice is always like, go to class. I still go to a class and I see people who make millions of dollars and they're still in class because they still need to be, they're not working at the moment, but like they need to stay sharp. They need to stay ready. Well, you know, there's one battle climbing the mountain. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other battle staying on the top of yeah. the mountain. Yeah. And that's that's what happens. And some people are really good at this part, but not so good at this part. No. And, and those are the ones whose and careers there's a famous, just melt away. There's a famous Philip Seymour Hoffman line. I don't know whether he said it to me or he said it in an interview, but he said, expectation is scary because he said, no, no matter what, if I go on set and I'm bad, it's just bad acting. It doesn't matter how good I've been in the past. That means absolutely nothing. If I go to work and we're on episode 21 and it's March and I'm tired and maybe I haven't looked at the pages long enough because I'm exhausted and my kids are at home. And it's like, if I show up to set and I'm not good, it's just bad acting, that's it. And so whether you're Philip Seymour Hoffman or Anthony Hopkins or me or some day player on a TV show, you're only as good as what you're doing right now. And so the, only, the, the advice I always give to actors is like, you've just gotta be doing it. Um, True. Because if you're talking about it and you're wishing about it and thinking, well, if I just got this, it's like, uh, that never works. You no. just need to be doing it. And you're the right. thing that you think you want won't happen but someone will see that happening and the place that you're supposed to be in will sort of manifest itself. All right, last question. Yeah. What's next? For me? Yeah, for you. I mean, I hope, to, uh, my kids are young. I'm, I happen to be fortunate enough to be on a TV show that shoots in LA with people I love. So I hope this thing goes on for- 20 seasons. Eight or 10 years. And then, and then we'll see. I mean, I'm so fortunate, I, I, I don't, I, lo I, I love what I do. So I would happily just go do a play at the Geffen Playhouse for a year. I, I, um, and I, I'm fortunate that I, uh, that I have a lot of friends who are as passionate about what I do as, so I, the, good, the good best answer is I don't know. And uh, I'll be fine either way. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much Thank for you. doing of this. Of course, my um, pleasure. I hope that maybe uh, you can come to Leap this year. So I'd love it's to. It's July 16th to the 22nd. When do you I guys will... start filming again? I mean, it depends on the writer strikes. So. All right, well, yeah. we'll see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm also really grateful 
to the Citizen Theater. This is owned by the Salvation Army. They just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars renovating this. If you have an event, a concert, uh, a show, a play, or anything that you want to do in this theater, please go on our website. We're gonna show you a quick little video about some of the beautiful work that the Salvation Army does. And at the end, there's a QR code if you'd like to help us feed people who need to be fed. Please donate. Dr. Bill, over and out. Love doesn't discriminate. It doesn't pick and choose. When there's so much to fight against, love fights for. When others flee, love runs toward. And when darkness prevails, love doesn't despair. It never feels too small or too weak or too powerless to help. Love knows its worth and remembers its strength. Love isn't pro this or pro that, but proactive and protective. It's never quick to rage, but always quick to courageous compassion. Love gives everything and expects nothing. For 156 years, the Salvation Army has loved all who feel lost. With your help, We'll never stop.